How many of you know a politician or two or more who has a hard time answering simple questions? Their responses to the questions sound fat, fantastic, but they never actually answer the question. The root of this problem is the fear of admitting the truth. Thankfully, our next speaker not only embraces the truth, but he does it with enthusiasm and clarity. Bill Whittle is a political commentator, writer, director, and a pilot. Two things about Bill Whittle stood out to me. He has many videos on YouTube. One of his, his most famous one is his analysis on the Occupy Wall Street protesters. It has garnered over 2.4 million views on YouTube. And he also did a video about the Trayvon Martin case. And that has, I think, about 1.5 million views and counting. So make sure to look those up on YouTube. But something else struck me more. Bill Whittle has a video series where he is the virtual president of the United States. And, <laughs> and let me tell you why you're clapping, because he answers questions from the press corps. The most fascinating part about this is that he actually answers the questions with precision. And um, so with that in mind, the truth is not safe today. The title of his speech is Taking Back the Moral High Ground. Since he's not going to beat around the bush, you can say bye-bye Bush. Please join, me, please join me in welcoming Bill Whittle. Could you be a teenage child? Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Might as well start this evening by, uh, or this morning by uh, ruining my political career, so if you just excuse me for one second here. <laughs> we'll be doing that a little bit on and off today. It's thirsty work trying to save the country and civilization and the rest of the world. It's a really uh, great pleasure and a real honor to be back in Colorado. I just flew in from Los Angeles last night, and I can't tell you how pleasant it is to come and visit here in the United States. Uh, I grew up in America. And I'm always filled with a sense of pride to come back to the country in which I was born. I have a little stopwatch here to keep me on time. I've got a picture of Fidel Castro on it to keep me out of a four-hour territory here. But it's actually very, very good to be back in America around really excellent and good and decent people. Because I think if we're going to talk about regaining the moral high ground, we have to talk about the left and the progressives and the collectivists. Because everything that they've done to ruin this country has been predicated on one thing and one thing only. And if you see this, if you can hear this dog whistle, it'll be crystal clear to you. All of their policies, all of the questions they ask us, all of the gotcha questions, all of this stuff is predicated on them having moral superiority. But it's actually deeper than that because it's unearned moral superiority. They haven't earned their moral superiority. I can tell you this for an absolute fact. I live amongst them out in Los Angeles. These are not good people. As a matter of fact, I think you'd be seeing dead bodies everywhere on the freeways of Los Angeles, except for people in LA just pick up the bodies, put them in the front seat so they can drive in the carpool lane. They're not good people. They fight dirty. We fight fair. We fight fair because we can win if we fight fair. They know if they fight fair, they're going to lose, so they don't fight fair. They're not good people. And everything they do is predicated on a sense of unearned moral superiority. And if we're going to beat these dirty fighters, we have to understand that everything turns around this one idea. And if you can spot where their unearned moral superiority is and attack that, it's over. Because we have logic, and we have history, and we have reason, and we have data, and we have the truth on our side. They have to get all of that off the table. It's got to get off the table. So they will attack you as being evil or mean or racist or homophobic or bigoted or misogynist or whatever. And all we are is just a bunch of, of, of racists who want to take lady parts and put them in binders and ship them to China. And therefore, we don't have to deal with the arguments. But we're not going to let that happen anymore. We've seen too much of this. We've got to get in this fight. And we've got to get on the offense. So let me just tell you something. Yeah, you're right. Let me just give you a small example of how pervasive this is among the left. 
Just a few days ago, before I came out here, uh, I was uh, taking a look at my Facebook page. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a group called Politichicks, uh, Conservative Women in Politics, Politichicks did their listing of the hottest conservative commentators in America, and I came in third. <laughs> Obviously. No, it's a, it's a small pond. But the two people that ranked ahead of me were two friends of mine. One of them is Alfonso Rachel. I don't know if you know Zoe Rachel. He's terrific. Zoe is a black politi a political commentator I work with at PJTV. And the person who came in first in terms of the hottest political pundits in America on the conservative side were none other than Alan West. And he was showing off back there, getting his pictures taken. Where is he? Alan, stand up. There he is. He came in first after Zoe and then me in this obviously politically correct, obviously racially biased uh, uh, program that they had. And you and I are going to be stepping outside after this uh, program, uh, Colonel. So we got a little discussing to do about this uh, ranking thing. So says the scrawny weakling to the uh, hardened combat veteran there. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, a, a quick aside. If you're looking for a new president, and we are, you could do a lot worse than that gentleman standing in the back of the room there. He's just the best man I know. He really is. He's the best man I know. He's the real deal. Yeah, enough about him. You'll get to hear from him in a, in a few minutes. So anyway, on my, on my Facebook page, I made a new banner up after this, and, and since this is Eric Holder and Barack Obama's race-divided country, I put, home of the hottest, asterisk, conservative commentator in America. And then in the brackets, I put asterisk, white. Hottest, white, conservative commentator in America. And a couple days ago on my Facebook wall, somebody came in and said, you conservatives are all the same. Hottest white commentator, what a racist you are. Now, a lot of times people be inclined to let that go, but I wasn't in that mood. She put it on my wall. So I wrote back to this woman and I said, is this as typical as we are ever going to find of, of progressives in America today? You come into my house, you know nothing about me, nothing whatsoever. You launch accusations of racism against me without knowing the single thing about me. You act better than I am, morally superior to me, and then you hightail it and run. Not so fast. Come on back. Come on back. First of all, Alan West and Alfonso Rachel are close friends of mine. They're close friends of mine. It's a joke. Secondly, it's your policies, not mine, that have led to the destruction of black America. Not only black America. It's your policies, but not mine, that have led to the murder of 40 or 50 million people in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. You're also responsible, in a way, for the murders caused by the National Socialist German Workers' Party. You don't get to come into my house, accuse me of being a racist, pretend that you're better than me and smarter than me, and just walk away without me responding to this. So I cut and paste all this and put it up on my page. Uh, well, I, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't claim I'm better than you. Of course you did. Of course you did. You came in here and called me a racist. You know nothing about me. You might want to read about the debates that went on between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois about the future of this country for black people before you start throwing all this stuff around. And I put it up on the, on the front of the page and she got about 250 comments. Boy, you gotta get some, some, uh, some, some kind of cream on that wound. That burn looks like it's gonna hurt. And uh, Facebook suspended me for 12 hours and it was worth every minute of it. <laughs> not gonna put up with it, I'm not gonna take it. So it's this unearned moral superiority. I'll give you a better example. About a year ago, I was in Oberlin College. Oberlin is the most, is the most liberal university in America, ladies and gentlemen. Oberlin College is where reason and logic go to die. <laughs> and I was doing my little conservative dog and pony show, and after it was over, there was a whole stadium full of students up there in this room. And one kid, he was 18 years old, blonde kid, he was wearing a Colorado shirt, shame on you, blue shirt with a big flag on the front. And he said, so you're a conservative, huh? I said, you bet. He said, so I guess you're against affirmative action, huh? I said, you're darn right I'm against affirmative action. In other words, you knuckle-dragging Nazi don't care about black people the way that I do. The way that I do. I'm in favor. So he said, why are you against affirmative action? I said, well, it's pretty simple. I'm not a racist like you are. Oh, what? <laughs> I said, I'm not a racist like you are. You're the person who's in favor of this racist philosophy, not me. 
You're the person that thinks that a black person needs a 650 to get into a college, that a white person needs an 800 to get in. You're the one that believes that black people are stupider than white people. I don't believe that for a second. I believe that any black student in America who studies as hard as any white student can clear any bar that a white student can clear. I don't believe they're stupider than white people. You do. You're the racist, not me. And frankly, I'm a little embarrassed to be seen in the same room as you. Because it's true, because it's true. They are racist, they are racist. They, they talk about these things and they don't even understand the racism implicit in everything that they believe. But the point I'm trying to make here with these examples is, ladies and gentlemen, we can't just sit here and take this anymore. If somebody accuses you of being a wife beater or a pedophile and you look down at your shoes and, and shuffle your feet and mumble, People watching will assume that you are. The only response to charges of racism and homophobia and all the rest that they level against us all the time is not just a response, but it is a devastating counterattack. It's the kind of a counterattack that doesn't leave anything standing. There's nothing but rubble when you're finished. And then you turn this around and make it their fault. So. How can we do this? Well, we'll talk about some of the details in the boot camp later on, but let's just talk about a couple things real quick because when you think about how people vote in America today, very few people vote based on the issues or uh, on the, even on the basis of the politicians. Young people especially, if you ask how people vote today, they'll vote based on two things. What do they think is the morally superior position? In other words, which position makes me look better? Who do I vote for? Who makes me look better? And secondly, which one of these guys is the coolest? I hate to say it, but honestly, I'll bet you 30 or 40% of the population votes for the guy with the best suit and the best hair. I wish it weren't true, but it is. We fight for 2 or 3% of the population that hasn't made up their minds after four years of Barack Obama. You haven't made up your mind yet, and our entire strategy for winning the presidency is to go after that 2% of people? Why don't we start dressing well and acting well and, and talking like we believe what we believe and we get 40% of the vote just to be a pickup like that? So. Let me show you a little bit about how this works. Most people today in America, and especially young people today, it was true for us as well. All of our belief systems, everything we believe in, the reason we vote, comes to us through the pop culture. We don't realize it, but it's incredibly powerful and it's incredibly persuasive, and I'm about to prove it to you. If I was Barack Obama's campaign manager, and I wanted to have the control over your minds so that I could start a sentence and you would finish that sentence, I'd have you, right? I'd have you. If I could start a sentence and count on you to finish it, I'd have you. So we have all kinds of different age groups in here, so I'm going to do it three times, one for each different age group. I'm going to start a sentence, and I'm going to count on you not to leave me hanging here to finish the sentence for me. First of all, for some of our older members. Ready? I'm going to start a sentence. You finish it. Ready? Here we go. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane, it's Superman. Okay, for people about my age, ready? Uh, Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. It's Tropic Port aboard this tiny ship. And for the younger uh, kids out there, for the the youth, it seems today that all you see is violence in movies and sex on TV, you betcha. What did we just do there? Well, we talked about the theme from Superman, we talked about the theme from Gilligan's Island, and I talked about the theme from Family Guy. And everybody in this room who's watched those shows can finish those sentences, and that means that everything that was in those shows has gone into your head and it has stayed there, the same as, as if they'd given you a political tract. Now, if you're an older person and you were one of those people that could recognize Superman, then everything about Superman went into your head along with the theme. That's a pro-American patriotic message. That's why we're pro-Americans. Superman stands for truth, justice, and the American way. So if you could answer those, those, those lines about Superman, you were given, through the pop culture, an image of America that Superman reflected, a very pro-American, patriotic image. Now, if you're in the middle age group and you were able to answer the theme from Gilligan's Island, it's pretty much a neutral message. All you really get from Gilligan's Island is, you know, if you want to get on the, off the island, all you really have to do is just kill Gilligan. <laughs> but if you're a young person and you could finish the sentence for Family Guy, then all of the anti-Americanism, anti-capitalism, all of that anti-Christian bile that comes with Family Guy has gone into the heads of those young people, and that is why they vote. 
They vote because conservatives are uncool and conservatives are evil. And if we don't start going after this evil aspect face on, we're going to lose elections no matter who the candidate is. So how do we do that? Well, the progressives have been telling people through the pop culture for 40 years now the same simple message. It's not complicated. It's the same three points, and they repeat it again and again and again and again and again. And over 40 years, they've managed to turn the freest people in the world into a country that is about 50% collectivist and socialist. I hate to break it to you that way, but it's the truth. So what is this message that they keep giving us through the pop culture? Well, it's the same three points, and it's said again and again and again, and if you watch television or movies today, you'll see any one of these three points, usually all three, and here they are. The first thing that they tell young people, especially today, all the time, everywhere, is wealth is unearned. Wealth is unearned. Why is this important? Well, because if wealth was earned, if you're a millionaire because you got up early and stayed out late for 40 years to build a dry cleaning company, or Hobby Lobby, for example, perfect example, $3 billion in sales, that rich guy, he, he stole his money. No, he earned his money. But if you can convince people that wealth is unearned, then taking that gentleman's money is not stealing. It's redistributing back into the pot because he took what? More than his fair share. So, if you can convince Americans that wealth is unearned, you can have the most outrageous tax rates and the most redistributionist policies you possibly can imagine, and you're not stealing because he didn't earn it. It's not his. He stole it. So that message is out there all the time. The second message that they tell young people, especially today, is this. Everybody's special. This is part of the self-esteem movement. Everybody's special. Congratulations, nobody lost, everybody came in first, everybody gets a trophy, we're not going to keep score, what a wonderful job, operation great job, everybody gets a gold star, everybody's special. Well, folks, if everybody's special, then nobody's special, right? Honestly? And in America today, you can't come out and say, nobody's special, but you can come out and say, everybody's special, and it means exactly the same thing, doesn't it? Why is this important? There goes my Senate career. It's important for this reason, because if everybody's special, if everybody is inherently special, then achievement means nothing. Goals and hard work and everything means nothing. There's nothing more special or unique about a brain surgeon than there is about a guy who hung out in back of the 7-Eleven and smoked doobies all day. It's no difference. Everybody's special. So what good is achievement? What good is hard work? What good is discipline? What good is any of this stuff if everybody's special? Everybody's special is a way to make America into a collectivist nation because we're all the same. Isn't that what they want? They want us to stop thinking about ourselves as individuals and start thinking about ourselves as all the same. And they get that message all the time. And the third message that these progressives give to people through the pop culture all the time about their political party, the Democratic Party, is simply this. Let us help you. Let us help you. Who could argue with that? Let us help you. Let us give you free health care. Let us give you free housing. Let us give you free food. Let us give you free transportation. Let's give you free phones. Let us help you. Why won't those rotten, evil re Republicans let us help you? All we want to do is help you. We just want to help. We just want to help you. And we'll give you all this stuff. And all we want in exchange is all of your work, all of your energy, and all of your freedom. Let us help you. And when you take these three messages, wealth is unearned, everybody's special, and let us help you, and you pump that into the pop culture for 40 years, you will produce and have produced a nation of collectivists, a nation of progressives who don't see any point in individuality or achievement of any kind. They're set to vote for Barack Obama. Barack Obama is not the problem. Barack Obama is the symptom of the problem. It's this cultural decay that's the problem. Okay, so there we are. So what do we do? How do we fight back? You know, it's actually astonishingly easy to beat this pe these people. It's actually remarkably easy to beat these people. I was talking with Tammy Bruce, who's a remarkable person, after a Tea Party event a couple years ago, and, and Tammy said, do you realize how weak their arguments is? Do you realize how much effort it takes on the part of the left to paper up every single window in the building so that not a beam of light gets in there? And she said it's because truth has presence. Light has presence. 
You can't put darkness into a room. There are no darkness generators. You can't turn on darkness machines. All you can do is take the light out. Now, keeping light out of a room is a lot harder than you think because if you light a birthday candle at the 50-yard line of the Superdome at nighttime, turn all the other lights off, that little candle is going to light up that whole building. Maybe not very brightly, but it will light it up. So truth is on our side. Logic's on our side. History's on our side. Fact is on our side. Evidence is on our side. They have to keep the message out. But we can win this fight very, very simply. So if they use those three messages, wealth is unearned, Everybody's special and let us help you to make progressivists. What messages do we have to send to people in order to turn them back into individual citizens who make up their own minds, choose their own courses through life, and essentially are conservatives? It's actually very simple. Simple three things. Now, I thought that the three things we need to sell to people in order to turn them back into American citizens is freedom, private property, and virtue. But if you say freedom, private property, and virtue to young people today, they'll just look at you with glassy eyes. They don't know what that means. So you have to reduce this to a term that everybody can understand. So I'm going to talk mostly to young people out here, but this is useful information for all of you. If you want to turn people back into conservatives and back into citizens, you just have to ask them three questions. The first question is, raise your hand if you're the kind of person that likes to be left alone. Now raise your hand if you're the kind of person that likes to tell other people what to do. If you ask this question to a college campus with 20-year-olds, there's not a single person, not one, not one, who will say, hey, I'm the kind of person who likes to tell other people what to do. Some of them do want to tell other people what to do, but none of them will admit it because it's not morally cool to tell other people what to do. So if you just simply ask people, do you want to be left alone or do you want other people to tell you what to do? They'll all say, I want to be left alone. That's freedom. You might want to think about the party that's not trying to tell you what kind of car to drive, how big your sodas can be, whether or not you can have air conditioning in your house, what the mileage of your car should be, what these different food types are, none of this. That's those guys. They're the guys who want bicycle helmet laws and motorcycle helmet laws and all that other stuff. I want to be left alone. That's part one. You've got them a third of the way there. The second thing you have to do is convince people that private property matters, that you own private property. And the best example I had of this was, uh, was at Oberlin, same, same event. I asked people in that audience after the show, I said, raise your hands if you consider yourself a socialist. Now, this is Ober Oberlin, folks, but I hate to break it to you. It's probably about seven out of ten. Openly admitted, they're socialists. Raise your hand if you're a socialist. Seven out of ten of those students raised their hands. I said, okay, what's the primary tenet of socialism? They didn't know. I shouldn't have to argue your side for you, but let me do it. <laughs> Don't you guys believe that it should be from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Yeah, yeah, that's what we believe. We like that stuff. That sounds good. We like that. Okay. All of you socialists up there, just the socialists, what kind of, what kind of phones do you, got, uh, do you have? I have, a, I have an iPhone 5. What do you guys have? And they're holding up their iPhones and their Samsungs and stuff. And I said, um, okay, bring them on down. I'm sorry? Bring them down. What, what, why do you want us to bring our phones down? I'm not going to steal them. I'm not a Democrat. I, I, I'm just going to put them in a box here. And then after we're done tonight, we're going to take these 25 or 30 smartphones that we have from the socialists, we're going to put them in a box, and then we're going to head to downtown Cleveland. We're going to find a pawn shop. This many smartphones, we should get two grand for these easily. Two grand is, what is that? Is that $120 bills? That sounds about right. Uh, <laughs> then... We're going to drive through Cleveland and we're going to distribute the $20 bills to the poor people of Cleveland from each according to their ability to each according to his need. Bring down the phones. And they don't bring down the phones. You know why? Because they're not socialists. That's why. <laughs> they're all about. They're all about wealth redistribution so long as it's somebody else's wealth being redistributed to them. But when it's time for them to redistribute their own wealth to people who are in greater need, suddenly they become rock rib conservatives who believe in private property. And you have to call them out on this to their faces. You have to call them out and make them live up to their standards of socialism. Come on. You know you have an Xbox in your house? We know you all have an Xbox in your house. That that toy of yours, that toy that you use occasionally could feed a village or at least a family in Africa for a year? Sell it. Do what you claim to believe in. They won't do it because they're not socialists. They're conservatives. They just don't even know it. They've been told something different all their lives. 
And the final thing I think you have to do to win people over to conservatism and independence and, and that sense of, of citizenship is you have to sell virtue. And the way you sell virtue is actually very simple. Believe it or not, this young generation is a very virtuous generation. They really, truly are. They're just confused. They've never heard these things before. So if you're talking to young people and you want them to believe in virtue, you say, all right, what's virtue mean? I know people think it means like prudence and chastity. No, virtue is very simple. Virtue means this, don't be a jerk, okay? Don't be a jerk. How many of you out there think you have a right to be a jerk? How many of you out there think it's okay to hit somebody or take their stuff? Raise your hands. None of them, none of them believe it's okay to hit somebody or take their stuff. Don't be a jerk. If you're not a jerk, we can leave you alone. Because if you're not a jerk, you're a virtuous person, you're a good person, you can be free and we can leave you alone. If you're not a jerk, we can leave you alone. If you are a jerk, then all of a sudden we need what? We need policemen and traffic cameras and we need bailiffs and we need wardens and we need prison guards and we need lawyers and we need all this other stuff to make sure that you don't act like a jerk. So just don't be a jerk and we can all be left alone. This is not a problem for them to get. Folks, if this party cannot sell freedom, private property and virtue, then we don't deserve to be in this business. Who can't sell those things, honestly? Honestly. So when I did this uh, Trayvon Martin thing, I closed it after I made the case for showing the kind of person that both Trayvon Martin was and George Zimmerman was. I closed it by saying this. There's a picture of Martin Luther King going around in a hoodie. The, tra the Justice for Trayvon crowd are picturing Martin Luther King in a hoodie. And I closed this video by going on offense. After I'd shown that Trayvon Martin was not a boy, he was a grown man, he had a lot of drug problems, he had a lot of violence problems, and he had a history of burglary. And after I showed that, that, uh, that George Zimmerman was not only not a racist, but was probably the biggest anti-racist in the community, I didn't just leave it there, I went on offense. I put a picture of, of Martin Luther King in that hoodie up that had been circulating around the web. And I said this, I said, why do we revere Martin Luther King? Why do we have a Martin Luther King Day and not an Al Sharpton Day or a Jesse Jackson Day or a Louis Farrakhan Day? Why do we have a Martin Luther King Day? Because Martin Luther King, in his famous I Have a Dream speech, said his entire life's work boiled down to this sentence. He said, I have a dream that I will one day live in a country where my four children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And the president and the attorney general and all of the prosecutors in that trial have done everything in their power, including all of the media, to make sure that the American people know nothing about the content of Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman's character and care only about the color of their skin. Showing Martin Luther King in a hoodie is repulsive and it's disgusting. It's an inversion of everything that Martin Luther King believed in. It's absolutely disgusting. So why, why are you on your feet applauding? You're on your feet applauding, not for anything I said, you're on your feet applauding because that is the truth spoken forcefully and with belief. You know it's the truth. The fact that you all came to your feet in, in roaring applause over a quote from Martin Luther King is the evidence, as if evidence was needed, that you are not in fact racist, that you are the opposite of racist. So the only thing I'll leave you with tonight is simply this, this afternoon is, is this. Charges of racism only work against people who are not racist. It makes you shut up because it's such a reprehensible and disgusting thing to be called. You'd rather just shut up than have somebody call you a racist. Ku Klux Klan member doesn't have any problem being called a racist. A Nazi doesn't have any problem being called a racist. They are racists, but you're not. And that's why these charges have been so effective against you. Don't let them get away with it anymore. Charges of racism, homophobia, misogyny are simply ways to get you to shut up. Because if you don't shut up, we're going to mop the floor with these communists. We're going to mop the floor with them because they have a nothing but a history of ruin and failure. And if we start talking about their track record of ruin and failure, they're going to lose. 
So hopefully you'll stick around a little bit later when we get into the boot camp, we'll start talking about these points, but remember, remember, listen for the dog whistle. Every policy, every politician, every position, all of it has the sense of unearned moral superiority. Find out where that moral super superiority is, walk up to it, and kick it in the knee as hard as you can, and everything will take care of itself after that. Thank you very much for having me. We'll see you later on this afternoon. All right, get your pocket knife out and whittle on that. Hey, wow. <laughs> the great thing is that he's on again at Conservative Persuasion Boot Camp at 2.30 in this room, and, and the only thing that will be different is at that point he's going to tell us what he really thinks. <laughs> Bill Whittle, tremendous, taking back the moral high ground. I've tossed some curves to these speakers by kind of making up their topics for them. Nobody ever fulfilled their assigned speaking topic more ringingly than Bill Whittle. Thanks so much.